interesting uh, dialogue here, both uh, both on topic as well as I think that's an open invitation for all of us to ask lots of questions. So Eric Herzog is a technical fellow at Saab Aeronautics. He received his PhD at the Department of Computer and Information Sciences at Linköping University in Sweden. His professional interests include development and introduction of system engineering processes, specification methods, information modeling, tool integration techniques, and change leadership. So with that, Eric, I'm looking forward to your presentation and thank you so much for uh, switching the schedule with us. No problem, thanks Robert. Um, first question, can you see my screen? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so let's go. Because we are here, we know that uh, OSLC is the answer, uh, but then there are some open questions. So as Robert said, I'm, I'm working for, for Saab, um, and we all know uh, what Saab is doing, right? So in the morning when I get to work, I just get into my Saab vehicle. No, I don't. <laughs> but um, so, so we do do fighter aircraft uh, and also airborne early warning systems, and uh, also together with Boeing, we are building the the T seven trainer. Um, so, uh, for aerospace, a pretty small company in located in Linköping in in Sweden, we we have uh, the Swedish language has a number of tongue twisters um, and. The, the way to say sh is uh, one of them, uh, just to tease the foreigners. Um, so th these are some products that my organization is developing at the moment. And if we look upon these products, uh, we can say they they live for a very long time. They're safety critical. There are they are in continuous development throughout their lives. It's not like uh, a car or traditional car you you develop it and uh, uh, then it's out i mean the every two years about uh, we have a new edition out for 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 our products and the new capabilities that we add are quite quite substantial and and we look here the the development system life is substantially shorter than the system life so if we look in the past, uh, we need to replace our development system at least twice over the life of the system. And, and this is, uh, as we're becoming more and more digital, it's becoming more and more tricky to do this. Um, so this is the, the world we're living in. Um, and another observation is that our life has become very unpredictable. Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious the grip and we are developing it in with support from the Swedish state, but in collaboration with Brazil. So we had to learn international collaboration. The Global Eye um, was first bought by the uh, UAE. So the Swedish uh, Air Force wasn't the first customer. And of course, the T7 uh, is the Boeing collaboration. So what we've learned is that we have to be aligned with international best practice. We, we should be your best speaking partner in international aerospace, uh, in the international aerospace language. And we need to have the ability to adapt to uh, um, so that so we have really to make sure that we are flexible. And, in, in, and when we are selecting uh, new development environments, we want to optimize the overall capability and have the ability to adapt to the latest processes, methodology and tools. And to do this, to match new product development scenarios, could be a new collaboration, it could be a new national opportunity. We have to have the ability to do this at a very low cost to make sure that we are always cur always current in our development environment. And if we look upon it, this is where we want to go, but looking at the world we're living in, uh, it, it's completely different. We are, we are having uh, lots of standalone, not non-integrated tools, proprietary integrations, uh, and, and moving from one tool, uh, migrating information from one tool 
to another. It's just a nightmare. And we tend to stay on with um, very obsolete uh, or at least obsolescence to tool set. And it, it's not, to be, to be honest, our, our engineers, they're working in high tech, but we are giving them the high tech solution of 15 or maybe 20 years ago. And, and it, it's not where we want to be in the future. But of course, we, we, we still want to have the integrated environments, the, the nice integration provided uh, by OSLC or by providers directly. So this is where we are, not a very fancy place, but where do we want to go? And this is something where I think our needs uh, are very similar with the needs of very many other organizations. Maybe we want to create an integrated engineering environment. So we need to provide integration within a development process. It could be our systems engineering process, our mechanical engineering process, or our software engineering process. Or it could be that we are we need to integrate between processes um, to ensure that our systems engineers uh, have proper integration with the software engineers. And we need to be able to do this while the individual applications are, are changing over time. Um, so our operational need is for standards-based integration. And if we can get to a situation where we can plug and play uh, and, and really minimize the integration and, and the maintenance costs of the integration, we would be in a situation which would be very close to ideal from, from our perspective. And as you can imagine, uh, we believe that OSLC is the right standard for doing this. And in particular, our, our, our objective is to provide our engineers or our employees with integrated development environments where we can do everything we need to do within that engineering discipline. So among our systems engineers, you should be able to do your requirements analysis. Uh, your system architecting, design, implementation, the analysis, safety analysis, ILS analysis, and so on, but also to be able to do the uh, V and B, uh, and also to do the declaration that we are conformant with requirements. We want to be able to do that, do that in in an integrated environment. So, if you're a systems engineer, we should minimize the time you need to switch between applications. And the other objective is that we want to bring together management, so project management, line management, uh, configuration managers, and engineers in the single environment. So we can make them all look upon the same product data and agree what they on what they are analyzing, what is the change item. And in doing this, we say we can we can accept redundant capabilities. So if we have a separate requirements management capability for our software engineers compared to what we have for our systems engineers, that shouldn't be a problem. Because what we want to do is to upgrade and replace environments without upsetting, without upsetting the complete PLM landscape. And we can see, for instance, that in, in, in software engineering, we have the fastest uh, evolution so maybe we need to change the software engineering environment for a particular project. We should be able to do that and replace it with a more modern one. Or it could be that we're starting a new project, project and the systems engineering and hardware engineering environments, they might be all right, but we just need to change the software engineering environment or perhaps our interface towards our suppliers. So being able to do that quickly and to adapt to new scenarios is very important for us. But of course, we are doing safety critical systems. Traceability is extremely important for us. And, and when we are looking at our um, um, when we're looking at our processes, we see four distinct areas where we need to do or do and maintain traceability between information or configuration item nodes 
belonging to different engineering disciplines. So we need to be able to do requirements traceability. We need to trace the product structure. We need to maintain change control and also to keep track on what have we realized, what have we put together. So the realization structure will work on serial numbers, whereas the configuration item structure will work on part numbers. Um, and of course, we know that um, when we trace, uh, we need to be able to trace the right version uh, and not just the latest and greatest. So um, the OSLC configuration management capabilities are very important for us. And also, if this standard will be widely implemented, we can exploit it for low cost and high quality integrations. So clearly for us, the answer is OSLC. It, it, it's quite important and, and, and obvious. There is no other standard that can do the job to, our, to the best of our knowledge. But there's just one problem. When, when we talk to our IT people or suppliers, they say something like this. So, so the, the problem is, or, or sometimes they are not as polite. Sometimes they say that, uh, yes, we like modularity, but what you're proposing is madness. But it, it's the same thing. Um, we need um, to make OSLC more well-known. So the problem, how, how do we get from this answer? I mean, what, what do you say, OSLC, well, what is it? to the obvious already we have oslc interfaces they are already there implemented and ready for you to use um, so how do we get from the left dog to the right dog and why is it the case that there are so few dogs that know the answer um, and I, I i'm not an implementer i'm, I'm just a systems engineer so I, I don't understand very much, but I have some theories and I will test them on you. Um, so from my perception, I, I think we as end users, we are, we are not visible. I mean, we, there's no or very little visible commitment to support OSLC. Um, I, I have attended a few uh standards group meeting and uh it was very friendly um it was uh, super uh, informative and i was very much welcome except that um the other people they they spoke another language i couldn't understand a thing um and also when we are trying to to implement um oslc we it's it's kind of an adventure, especially when you're looking at the configuration management part. Perhaps we are bad readers of, of the standards, but finding the examples how to interpret the standard has been terribly difficult. And also we have the small size of the standards group. I mean, there's only so much you can do when, when it is a very small group. So I uh, just, disclaimer um, these questions are of course they are provocative on, on purpose and i have to admit that um, uh, there are things that i could have done for saab um, um, to show our my organization's support for oslc which i haven't done so um, I, I i'm a sinner myself now I, i'll try to move you on Tegler out of my screen. You, how can I ignore this one? Oh, he's gone. Good. Um, so let's look at uh, the, these additional questions. I mean, is there a lack of end user uh, commitment? Um, I mean, and we have to ask ourselves if how can my organization, how can I benefit and invest in a standard when there are so few other organizations doing it. And if we want plug and play out of the box, there have to be many boxes. 
So we as end users, as large organizations, we have to be very clear here that this is something we need. Otherwise, we will not get anything to play with. So how can we as end users communicate our interests in OSLC, not just as um, um, uh, at events like OSLC Fest, but making it persistent? What are our use cases? And how can the community uh, provide the space for, sh uh, for showcasing those use cases and also the solutions? If, if we need something, uh, then there will be opportunities, I'm sure, for providing the answers. And then the standards group, I mean, the and whether it's closed or not, it, it's what I perceive. Um, we have very extensive standards, not so extensive like STEP, but still extensive standards. And the entry threshold I, I've found is, is quite high. Uh, the group has great potential, ample ideas for improvement, but the regular meetings are very short. And when you step in, uh, it's very difficult to grasp what's going on and, and how can you contribute? So the question is really, how can we lower the, the entry threshold? And maybe dedicated sessions uh, with uh, longer justifications of standard constructs, training for, for new specialists, or, or even for me, if I can still learn something, uh, and very clear near and long-term strategies i think given this we, we would see more people uh, being interested in, in joining the group and then we have the question of implementations as, as adventures again the specifications are extensive but very very few examples and I find this is especially true for the configuration management part. Uh, in our own projects, we, we, we came from a stepper background and we were speculating where were product data really stored? Where, where, where was it captured? And it took uh, quite some confused calls with, with specialists like Iran and Ian to actually figure out how, how things are working. And maybe not every organization have access to the specialists. So we need to create the clear examples, explaining the concepts and relationships, the call sequences, what to look out for, and the lessons learned. If we have them, we have the basis for a community. And, and then we have the small size of the standards group. Um, and I mean, it, it's a small group and uh, the number of experts is small. They, you, they have a lot of their agendas, but how can we grow, grow the group and share the workload and train new people to support the specialists? Well, maybe we can do it by doing the first step to increase the end user commitment to show that this is, this is a place to go. We can extend the standards group activities to include investments in, in creating new experts. And one way of showing that you're on your way to becoming an expert is to create the examples. Because then the, newbie, the newbies would grow and it would be a good opportunity to exchange experiences. So just to summarize, um and um I'm, I'm, i must apologize for uh being the outsider and and providing um unwanted advice but uh we have to say that oslc it, it's uniquely positioned it's the, the capability it's just excellent but it's hampered by the fact that um the dogs out there they they don't understand what you say that I, I want OSLC and how it's really about going from the surprise dog to the service oriented dog the dog that already knows the answer so
So, uh, I'm a little bit worried now that I have uh, blown whatever reputation I had in this community, but um, um, hopefully you're, you're still listening to me. <laughs> I, I don't think you've you've blown anything. I think you've you've asked some very important questions and and, and given a good a, a different perspective. Um, so, as someone who plays in this this realm as well, I think that we have uh, a great many different set of uh, perspectives and users, and they all need to come together. Um, you talked about the end user. We have the tool vendors or developers. We have the IT teams. All of them need to come together. And I think you're asking the right questions. Um, I'd also like to thank you for including dog pictures in your uh, presentation. So I now know it's okay for me to include pictures of my dog in my presentation tomorrow. So that, that just that, to be clear, uh, these are not my dogs. It's uh, <laughs> I, I just want, want the, the right hand dog, not uh, not not the left hand dog. Uh. And, okay. and the, right now, just to be clear, we are, we are doing a project together with Eurostep uh, and the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, uh, where we are testing the, the architecting, architecture pattern uh, that I showed earlier on and, and also gaining experience in OSLC. And I have to say, of course, that this is supported by Vinova, the, the national funding agency. So, of course, very grateful for that. But let's go back to the dogs. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, so we have a, a couple questions here, and let me try to parse through them a little bit because I think some of them have been answered along the way, and somewhere we're adding some additional um, uh, context as well. So, so David Honey was was kind enough to post, uh, as you mentioned, configuration management, um, the primer that's online to be able to talk about how to understand that. Um, and, and I think that's valuable. I think also um, I'd be curious about your perspective as an end user, if that level of detail, if you're familiar with that, is it important or is there a next level for the system engineers to be able to understand the whole role configuration management, um, not the details of how configuration management works from OSLC standard, but are they unfamiliar with configuration management as a whole to begin with? No, I, I, I think... Uh, the Prima is it's excellent, but if there would have been uh, three or four very clear examples um, included or provided as an appendix, that would have increased the speed of our understanding on how to do configuration management within OSLC. The team or our project team is very well versed in well, versed, sorry, in, in, in step. And we know the the way to handle configuration management in the step by heart. And and since our SLC is doing it in a different way, uh, when, we, with the, uh, when there are not so many examples, uh, made us speculate and and uh, unfortunately we speculated wrong in in some instances um maybe we didn't read thoroughly enough but but more examples we would have helped us enormously yeah I, I, and i think that's extremely valuable and and that's that's why we have these events like this i think they're important for for us all to participate and to to give those examples it's always hard to be the first adopters um, and it's it's we're thankful for all the first adopters that we have in a, a standard such as this. But you need to gain momentum, you gain momentum by implementation, by example implementations, um, and people asking questions on how to be able to make it better, um, it, as well as more and more people participating to be able to produce the standard. And and I think that's been the message so far from your presentation as well as from the other presentations uh, ahead of them. So um, very thankful for that. Um, see if there's a couple other questions that we might get in here uh and before we before we move on to our next presentation um uh there there is a little bit of a discussion here in terms of the difference between uh tools that have been very well known for uh, proprietarily holding their data versus ones that that um support open standards and so i 
So um, can you speak a little bit in terms of your like selection process for tools? Is open standards a mandatory thing for you or are you looking to be able to adapt the tools that are out there with other adapters and implementations to be able to connect them to open standards? So where we want to go is, is of course to select the tools that have the open standards implemented. Um, we can't do, do that at the moment. Um, unfortunately um and and we see uh the this negative reaction by the some of the very large suppliers that uh, uh they uh, i mean we we are not airbus we are not boeing uh we're very small we're just a few thousand people um so they can afford saying uh no to us but they can't afford to say no to the really big players. Uh, so, so what what I'm saying is that the smaller player, which provides the support for the open standards, would be very high on our list. Okay, and and that that's great, and I think that's a good message out to to some of the 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 smaller companies as well, both both on a, a, a vendor standpoint as well as an end user standpoint. Participation in the standard helps build commonality, helps build uh, momentum uh, for all of us to be able to work towards a con common standard and being able to be uh, capable of, of bringing everything together, much like some of the larger entities in our in our business that uh, encourage things to happen. Although we, we definitely, uh, appreciate those large tool vendors and, and, and large user bases to participate in the standard as well to be able to help build that momentum. So really good. Thank you so much, Eric, for the participation and the perspective, as well as some flexibility as we dealt with some technical di uh, difficulties on the other end of, of some of our other presenters. So with it's that, part of our gene. So <laughs> I'll, I'll stop sharing. Now. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, now I think we can uh, go ahead and switch back to who was originally supposed to be our third presenter, who with some some technical skills in the background by by some of our team members and persistence by Martin uh, is is going to be joining us here.